we're going to jump into this. We got the free agency hype meter for, for Marcus, for everyone who's never seen this or heard of this before. What we're going to do is we're going to rank our excitement for these players that have now signed to these NFL teams on a scale of one to 10. Really simple. Okay. And it's all just make believe the points don't matter. This is basically whose line is it anyways. It, it's just, just, just go with it. All right. So let's hop into, I guess, the biggest news story of the weekend. Yeah. Justin Fields going to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Seems like a lot of people feel a whole lot of ways. Marcus, I want to talk to you first here. Let's get your feedback on Justin Fields and where is he at on your hype meter? Uh, right now, as of this moment, I would probably say it's a four. Um, just because, you know, the early the early returns, the early scuttlebutt is that he's not going to be the starter, that it's going to be Russ's job. You know, I'm I sort of reserve judgment on that. I want to see an actual competition in Pittsburgh to see sort of who can win out there, especially because the Steelers. It's not like the Steelers are on the hook financially for a big number for either one of these guys. Why not just let them battle it out? You don't really lose anything there. But, you know, just going with the premise that he's going to be the number two, that obviously knocks down uh, his potential a little bit. I believe secretly that he's going to be the starter before the season is out. I think he takes over yeah. for us at some point. But then again, look, you know, they lose uh, Deontay Johnson to Carolina. I mean, George Pickens saw some improvement last year, but it's still sort of mercurial. Like, you just don't know necessarily from week to week what you're going to get out of them. Um, you know, it, they really could go on and try to hashtag establish the run a whole lot this year. So, I mean, like, my excitement for him is just sort of mild. Uh, it, it's a four. It's just, you know, I don't know. I just feel like there are more obstacles than there are really pathways for him having success. Yeah, and I'm, I'm pretty much in complete agreement with you. I'm a three, so even a step below. And I, I love Justin Fields, but I don't know what to make of this quarterback room. Uh, we haven't really seen Arthur Smith do much of anything with the quarterback since he had that like two year stretch with Ryan Tannehill in Tennessee. And it's been kind of bleak since then. I'm not really too crazy about this Pittsburgh roster. And I think that you're right. You know, looking at it with Najee Harris and Jalen Warren, they are going to run the ball a lot. But it, it's hard to get excited for Justin Fields right now is fun as he is, you know, virtuoso on the field, the things he can do off script, we don't even know if he's going to be starting. And if he does get the starting job, we don't even know if it's going to be week two or week 12. So it's really tough to get very excited. I love Justin Fields. I hope that he can, you know, kind of use this as a reset year and come back, whether it be later this season or in 2025 with the vengeance and show everybody what he can do. I just don't know if we're going to see it this year in Pittsburgh. God, you know what? I was waiting for that, Dave. I was really waiting for this just to kind of just sit here and relish in your heartbreak a little bit. How's, <laughs> how's, how's the divorce going so far? Dave? <laughs> I got to retire the shirt because, after today. So I'm getting it one last time. Because, <sighs> wow. Character. That was a hard left turn. It's, I was totally expecting you to come on here. Like I'm still a seven. Like I'm excited for just, and then <laughs> drop, drop in a three on our boy, Justin. Um, you know, yeah, thing, I, I was reading the tea leaves here and we talked about this a few times over the last month or so. I, I, I didn't see a lot of a market for him. Um, and we went through like team by team. These are the teams that need Justin Fields. And this this is why it probably won't work out had there not been this weird locker room drama with I, I don't know if you guys saw the reports like Kenny Pickett apparently yeah. wasn't happy about Russ being there so they shipped him off for a sack of peanuts and then a QB2 spot became available like if it weren't for that Kenny Pickett outburst there might not even be Justin Fields in Pittsburgh it was just I don't know man it's it's a weird scenario um, which as a good friend a of mine by the way said the other yeah. day like imagine being Kenny Pickett and having demands it's <laughs> <laughs> crazy but i mean what what pittsburgh did and you alluded to it marcus it's crazy they they added draft capital in trading away kenny pickett and then bringing in justin fields they improved their draft capital and then they signed russ for a vet minimum i mean they went from kenny pickett to two very high ceiling guys for for close to nothing i mean it's it's really impressive what omar khan has been able to pull off over the last few years and especially this offseason dude he, uh, he just needs to lose Ryan Pohl's number because Ryan yeah. Pohl's like, every, every time they talk, something bad happens. Uh, I'm, I'm also just going to go with a three here. Uh, I know there's the whole thing with, you know, Russ is the starter. And listen, last year he started out one and five for the Broncos. And I know the Steelers are in a very tough division. They've got a tough schedule. 
and it is possible he starts off kind of rough here to begin the year and Justin Fields takes over. But this is also the Arthur Smith offense that they're going to lean heavily on that run. The defense is good enough to keep them in games. And the Arthur Smith offense kind of protects quarterbacks doing a lot of play action, a lot of simple throws, stuff that I think Russ can do. Not to get into all the nuts and bolts of it, but I think we're probably going to see Russ be the starter here for a bit. And with that, let's just hop right into our next guy. Same room, same team. Russell Wilson for the Pittsburgh Steelers. I, I think it's already been said here, but I think we love the move of having these two guys in the quarterback room. It was a very low cost, low risk move for the Steelers. Let's see who actually ends up being good, but how high is the ceiling? How hyped are we about this? Marcus, let's hear it from you. Uh, I'm, I'm even less hyped. I'm gonna give him a three. I'm less hyped about this than I am Justin Fields. One, because I don't think he's going to be the starter all year long. The thing I keep looking at with Russell Wilson the thing that I think has troubled him the last couple of years is that the two things that he really did well that helped him for so many years in Seattle are gone now. And that's that's one, uh, his, his ability to run. He does not run the way he did earlier in his career, which, look, that happens as you get older. It just kind of affects everybody. Um, but the other thing is he had that great deep ball, right? I mean, he just had that wonderful deep ball, those moonshots he was throwing up there that would always come down in the bucket. But now you've got defenses that are frequently or more frequently just playing too high safeties, right? I mean, I remember was it was a couple years ago, everybody's like, oh, the league's figured out Patrick Mahomes. We're just going to put two safeties back there. And, like, the dude has three Super Bowl rings, so yeah. good luck with that. Um, but everybody's playing more too high safeties. They're taking away that deep throw. So now – you have sort of neutralized the two things that have made Russell Wilson so successful in his career. And to your point about Arthur Smith's offense, yeah, maybe they do some things to sort of try and work around that a little bit, but then it becomes a question of does Russ comply or does Russ go out there and be Russ and just try to do his own thing, in which case this whole marriage is not going to work. So um, throw that in with the fact that, like I said, I don't think he's going to be the starter all year long, and I just I have very limited excitement for Russell Wilson in Pittsburgh. Yeah, it's hard to follow that up, Marcus. You pretty much said everything I wanted to say. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of the things that he struggled with last year in, in Denver. And first of all, I don't think he was quite as bad as people made it out to be. I think that it was just a, a not a good pairing with him and Sean Payton. Sean Payton really wanted somebody that could run his offense, hit those timing routes, and like you said, Russ does his best when he can do things out of the structure of the play. And uh, he just doesn't do that quite as well as he used to anymore, but he still thinks he can. And you see him try to pl make these hero plays that don't really work out. Arthur Smith's offense very much so relies on play action and timing and these same things that he struggled with last year in Denver. So I I'm with you. Um, if I was, you know, my excitement level was a three for Justin Fields. It's a two for Russ Wilson. Not really too excited here. I think that maybe it could be okay for Pittsburgh. Um, but as far as fantasy goes, I mean, it would take a miracle for Russell Wilson with this supporting cast to end up being any sort of fantasy relevant quarterback. Well, howdy doody, guys. All right. Three for Russ from Marcus and a two from Dave. I guess I'm the high man on him. I'm going with a four. I'm not that excited. And it's weird to be the highest on Russell Wilson at a four. But uh, listen, I think that we've kind of seen this is just going to be a middle of the road thing. Like I'm not going to overstate this. Russ is kind of a middle of the road fantasy quarterback. Arthur Smith's offense for four quarterbacks in fantasy is kind of just middle of the road. Ryan Tannehill has been the best guy he had in terms of fantasy success. He was quarterback eight. Uh, you even go back to like Mike Tomlin with Ben Roethlisberger, even in some of his better years late. And it was like QB 12. Russ is probably just going to be somewhere in that grouping of like quarterback 16 to 18, like around a bunch of those guys, the older veterans that are getting drafted. I don't think anyone's building their fantasy drafts around him. Uh, I think that what this is going to do is it's just going to have some ripples for guys like George Pickens and, and the running backs and stuff like that. So, yeah, uh, I think this speaks volumes, putting Russ out of four and that being the highest possible hype rating <laughs> that we have on him. And I think that's the difference. If Russell Wilson starts, you kind of know what you're getting. Like you said, kind of middling QB2 output, where if Justin Fields does get the opportunity, we're immediately talking about him as a weekly top five quarterback option just because of that rushing upside that he possesses. It doesn't matter what his supporting cast is. He can turn nothing into something anytime he touches the ball. I guarantee you that at some point in some league you're in, somebody's going to say the phrase, and they will say it exactly like this. <sighs> starting Russell Wilson this week like it's going to be it's going to be said <laughs> in just that tone right because like I don't know somebody's going to be injured or it'll be a bye week and you like you scour the waiver wire and it's like it looks bleak out there and somehow like the matchup will be just good enough 
for you to sort of believe it can happen. And, you know, you'll talk like, I'm starting rust this week. Yeah, that's 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 exactly going to be the attitude. <laughs> We're gonna crop this and use it in season, like week eight. I'm gonna start <laughs> week show and one of us is like, yeah, he's got a good matchup. And, <laughs> and he'll be fourteen or better for three straight weeks, and then we'll have Marcus come in with that clip. <laughs> just, just make it an evergreen drop forever and ever. All right, last quarterback here that we are gonna put on the hype meter. This was probably the the biggest and best one for fantasy football purposes, maybe even NFL purposes. We'll see how this goes. But Kirk Cousins goes to the Atlanta Falcons. And I think this kind of caught everyone by surprise. Like, I don't I don't know. I think a lot of people just assumed that maybe Kirk was going to go right back to Minnesota. And then the Falcons were the name that kept getting brought up and the betting lines moved. And then, bam, here he is surrounded by Drake London and Kyle Pitts and B. John Robinson and, and a familiar offense. So, Marcus, how hyped are you about Kirk Cousins going to the Falcons? I'm gonna get. I'm gonna go with a seven here. Um, and it's not so much for Kirk. Like we know who Kirk Cousins is, right? Like he's going to be the same guy. Like he'll he'll probably finish somewhere between like quarterback ten and thirteen. He'll be that fringe QB one for you every week. Um, but the excitement is, and I think you know most of fantasy Twitter seem to agree, is what it means for all those guys around him. There were two things we wanted for the Falcons' offense this year. We wanted Arthur Smith out. And we wanted better quarterback play. Both those things have happened, right? Arthur Smith is in Pittsburgh. They now have an upgrade. I wrote two years ago, right? Marcus Mariota was terrible. And like Desmond Ritter got the job. We're like, we can't be worse than Marcus Mariota. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, watch. Um, (laughs) So I'm going to sit here and I'm going to sit here and unequivocally state that Kirk Cousins cannot be worse than Desmond Ritter. Um, So that's good news for Drake London. It's good news for Kyle Pitts, who is hopefully fully healthy now. Uh, They went out and added Darnell Mooney. I don't know how much opportunity he's going to get. Let me scroll the list. Is he? uh, He's sort of on our list, right? But (laughs) sort of. There's sort of on the list. Um, You know, so there's more opportunity there. Uh, So that makes me excited. As for Kirk, like, you know, he'll get drafted. He's not going to get drafted highly in a lot of leagues, but he's that guy you can have on your roster and feel pretty confident that when you have a bye week or you have an injury that you can plug him in um and he's not going to be a boat anchor on your roster but i'm just i'm just really really excited for what this means for all the skill position guys there in atlanta yeah that's exactly it my hype meter is at a nine for everything you just said i mean not for kirk cousins but because we saw kirk cousins support the wide receiver one in justin jefferson while also supporting the tight end one in tj hawkinson we know he's going to throw the ball a lot we know he gets the ball in the hands of his playmakers uh, Darnell Mooney, who you alluded to, I don't think he's going to be fantasy relevant himself, but he's going to stretch defenses, which is just going to open up even more opportunities for Kyle Pitts and for Drake London. So that's why I'm hyped. Um, I think this is one of the most fun signings that's actually going to have huge impacts in fantasy. Like we, we, we've talked about it year after year after year. Like if you look at the peripheral numbers for Kyle Pitts, this guy can play. He draws targets. He makes plays, but his, you know, on ball or what, what am I trying to it's catchable ball target percentage whatever I, I'm jumbling my words here but it was like less than 60 <laughs> percent like the majority of balls coming his way were deemed uncatchable now he has somebody that could actually put it on his number and allow him to make plays so my hype meter is at a nine just because of what it does for everybody else on this team yeah I'm gonna close this out you guys have basically said everything that needs to be said here about Kirk I'm also at a nine Dave I was actually gonna put myself at a 10 And I kind of had to bring myself back down to earth because it's still Kirk Cousins. And we still like it's not going to be a perfect offense. It's still a brand new play caller. It's still a guy coming off an Achilles. But it's for all the reasons you guys listed the the players around him. You've you've got B. John Robinson that could ascend into kind of like Todd Gurley RB1 overall territory here. Drake London could potentially be a top 10 or top 12 wide receiver in fantasy, maybe even better. Kyle Pitts, like we're all back on the bus. This is great. So for that reason, I'm going to put Kirk Cousins at a nine here. What is he's the a, definition uh, of insanity he's, he's, again? He's, going back to Kyle Pitts for the fourth year in a row? I mean, look, man, I'm doing it. I'm, I'm doing you know, it. I, it's funny. It's Cynthia only Freeland. it's only insanity if it's the exact same every single time. That's There's true. always been just like a one thing that's like slightly different each year. Mm-hmm. They yeah. keep just like just, yeah. just pulling the rug on us. It's, you know, it's like high school chemistry, right? You keep going back and you like you keep tweaking the experiment a little bit more. <laughs> and like hopefully it doesn't catch fire in the middle of the classroom. So like let's let's keep doing it. Uh, by the way, Kirk Cousins. Get the bag Hall of Famer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Get so the bag did, Hall of Famer. More career earnings than Tom Brady in like half the amount of time. Like yeah. just unbelievable what he's done throughout his career. With one career playoff win. <laughs> one. And I, my favorite I, is that he, 
he did this I, all while being the, like the I'll take the hometown discount kind of guy. Like he got that persona about him, and then like Kirko chains just pops out I mean, with money bags. Like ah, you don't need you don't need a whole lot of money to shop at Kohl's, right? I mean, it's just, <laughs> yeah. like, you don't you don't need to get the bag to shop it. Like we all can afford to shop at Kohl's. It's fine, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So to close out the quarterback category here, there's a few other guys that signed some deals. And we see Gardner Minshew going to the Raiders, Sam Darnold going to the Vikings. Out of those guys, well, one, do we think that any of them are going to have any fantasy success in 2024? And of those two, who do we think is more likely to have more success and potentially be starting for fantasy rosters next season? Ooh. So this this might be more of a a heart pick than a head pick because I'm a USC Trojan through and through. But I, I do think I do think there's still something there with Sam Darnold. The, mm-hmm. the thing about Sam Darnold is he will – he's like to, what I like to call like the uh, – like the, the, oh, like the Jameis Winston all-star, right, where he will put up decent fantasy numbers, but it's normally because he did some things in the first half of the game to force him to have to throw, right? Like he'll go like out, he'll portals. throw – <laughs> right, you know, he will go out and throw a couple of picks uh, early, early in the year, early in the game rather, and put his team down by a couple of scores. And then in the second half, he'll come out, he'll start slinging it, and you know, maybe he gets the win, or maybe he gets them at least close, and he'll end up with decent fantasy numbers at the end of the game. And it's like, well, yeah, but you sort of did that in spite of yourself. And I think at least in Minnesota, as long as they don't, you know, trade Justin Jefferson to Cincinnati or for whatever, you know, whatever that rumor is right now. As long as they keep Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison is there. You know, we'll see when TJ Hawkinson is able to get healthy and, and be back out there again. There are enough playmakers in that offense that I think Darnold, you know, he'll show his flashes. And I think he'll, you know, he'll have some weeks where, like, he will be sort of fantasy relevant. And, you know, Minshew, who's got some pretty good guys he's throwing to as well. With True. Monte Adams and Jacoby Myers, and hopefully we see uh, Michael Mayer take that step forward. But uh, I, I, I'm going to agree with you here that I think of the two, uh, I, I think and expect Gardner Minshew to have a better season. And, you know, also all, all the smoke right now is that they're planning to draft J.J. McCarthy. And I don't think there's any chance that they're trying to start J.J. McCarthy year one. I think everybody says that kind of the blueprint for a guy like McCarthy is to draft him. He's young. He's still raw. Let him sit for a year. So um, Gardner Minshew, with, with, with what he's getting paid and – Aiden O'Connell still being on the team and fans loving him. I think there's going to be a drum beat pretty quickly to flip back to Aiden O'Connell. There's no long-term plans with Gardner Minshew, where I think Sam Darnold is at least going to have a little bit longer of a leash and a little bit more job security throughout the season. I refuse to talk too much about either of these guys, so I'm just going to move <laughs> straight on to running back. Yep. Yep. All right, so let's get into the biggest names here for running back. And, I mean, let's just go right off the top rope here, guys. Saquon Barkley goes to the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, by the way, Dave, you're dead to me. You're dead to us. Great uh, great line this weekend from Tiki Barber, who's not oh. happy. <laughs> you, you were like, what is he saying? What did I do? Did you catch that though? Did you catch TV? I did. Like, yep, yep. And then like everybody else started memeing it after that. I saw Kyler Murray said it to uh to 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 Marquise Brown. Yeah, he <laughs> was leaning into it after that. <clears throat> Not a great oh, look. Man. Not a great yeah. look. But yeah. Do we pay attention to Tiki? Does anyone really? Uh, I don't even know what he's attention? doing. Is he still on TV? I, I guess I guess he's doing radio in New York now. Isn't that where I think that's where this whole thing came from? Like there a, it is. a radio show in New York. Everything yeah. has been solved right there. That one sentence. There we go. <laughs> All right. So for the running backs here, Saquon Barkley now finds himself in the Philadelphia Eagles. I mean, it seems like this is a pretty obvious step up for him, but where are we at on Saquon, Marcus? I'm I'm super fired up. I, give me a nine on Saquon. I mean, you're talking about the guy who, to me... Of all the big-name free agent running backs was the most versatile, right? I mean, he gives you that power running that you get out of Derrick Henry. He gives you that pass catching that you can get out of an Austin Eckler. He goes from an awful offense in New York to a much better one in Philadelphia. And I I think I tweeted something like this, and somebody's like, they were awful in the second half of the year. I'm like, okay, yeah, they played bad. They are still a good offense. They still have a ton of talent. Um, And I have this sneaking suspicion that the brotherly shove will not be as large a part of the offense. I don't think it completely vanishes. But I think losing Jason Kelsey makes that more difficult. I mean, you know, you had Kelsey, who was a road grader there in the middle of the line. You have a quarterback that squats like a ridiculous amount in Jalen Hurts, so that certainly helps. But now you've got a big, 
powerful back who can get those short yards for you? And why would you continually subject your franchise quarterback to that sort of, of punishment if you don't have to? So I think a lot of those short yardage touchdowns that DeAndre Swift managers, hi, it's me, I'm one of them, uh, <laughs> all missed out on last year. I think a lot of those start to go to Saquon Barkley. Uh, I just think the fact that the Eagles are score more uh, raises his potential touchdown ceiling. He's going to catch the football in that two-minute offense. Um, he's going to get those short yardage opportunities. Uh, this is sort of what I think we always hoped for Saquon. It just never materialized in New York. Yeah, I, I don't want to like you – know, I think nine is reasonable. I'm at a seven, you know, a little bit cooler. And the only reason I'm a little bit cooler on Saquon Barkley is because – He's 27 years old and he does have some injuries, but if he could put it all together, this is by far the best offensive line he has ever played. Like he's played behind a bottom five offensive line almost every single year that he's been in the league. And now he gets to go behind one of the best in the league. And, you know, my immediate reaction was, well, you know, they they have the, the tush push, so he's not going to score touchdowns. And Jalen Hurts doesn't throw to running backs all that much, but I dug into the data a little bit and Miles Sanders had double-digit touchdowns just two years ago, and DeAndre Swift caught a ton of passes last year. So there have been outs for running backs in this offense to get high-value touches. Saquon Barkley, much better player than either Miles Sanders or DeAndre Swift. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I think the only trepidation I would have here is because of previous um, – usage and, and and his current age but as long as he can stay healthy he's going to be at least like his floor as a healthy running back in this offense is going to be a top 10 running back all right so i'll close this out here i'm also at a nine i agree with marcus wholeheartedly here and i had a lot of those same concerns that you had dave like about you know he's gonna get the goal line touches he's gonna get the, the receptions the whole thing is this and and sometimes you know it's 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 a it's a ruse but you can also just follow the money a lot of times and stuff like this. And they paid Saquon like a top four running back. And I think a lot of that has to do with they are tired of putting their quarterback in harm's way and continuing to put Jalen Hurts in a situation where he might get hurt. And I think that when you go and you pay a guy like Saquon this much, you're not running the tush push as often. You're not you know, bringing in Kenneth Gainwell to spell Saquon Barkley as often as he was for maybe DeAndre Swift. There are things that Saquon does that a lot of these running backs from last year just couldn't do so i mean yeah like you already mentioned day like the eagles are a massive upgrade in terms of run blocking and scoring opportunity i think there's a really easy case here for saquon to be a top five running back i've even heard some people say as high as running back two overall just Ooh. because of uh, of the team that he's on so i'm not gonna go that high but i will put a nine here for saquon barkley on the hype meter I don't know if you know, but Saquon Barkley can also squat 600 pounds. You know, that's what we hear about Jalen Hurts every <laughs> single right. time they that's right. push him in the tush. But uh, Saquon Barkley, pretty strong dude himself. So uh, he could probably punch him. I mean, he was part of the also. quad squad at some point, yep. right, in his yep. career. So, yeah. <laughs> Breaking news, football players are strong. <laughs> Let's go to another very, very strong guy that is no stranger to awesome workout videos. Derek Henry signs with the Ravens. And we rarely get this, where – all of us, NFL fans, uh, random spectators, uh, my wife, and fantasy managers, and everyone all being like, you know what? Derrick Henry should go to the Ravens. And mm -hmm. then it happens. <laughs> and we all got what we wanted. So the real question here is, now, how excited are we actually about Derrick Henry this season? Because sometimes, it's, you know, th the grass isn't always greener on the other side, Marcus. Uh, yeah, this one, though, is Technicolor green. Like, I'm I'm in an eight for Derrick Henry here because it is everything we wanted, right? And you don't have to have, you know, do this mental gymnastics of, well, what if he gets, you know, what if they do this in short yardage? Or are they going to, like, we know who Derrick Henry, Henry is. We know what he does. Give him the ball. Get out of the way. If you can get him to the edges and have defensive backs making business decisions, that's an even better situation there. But either way, having Derrick Henry as a power runner there, having him you know, with this, this option, this read option back there with Lamar Jackson, and you've got defenders and linebackers trying to figure out, okay, do I, do I take Lamar? Do I take Derrick Henry? What do I do? That just feels like a nightmare. So I feel like the, the transition will be easy. Um, you got the, the best power runner that was available in free agency, <clears throat> excuse me, with uh, one of the run heaviest offenses in the league. Um, I mean, you talk about big, large, strong men. I always love telling the story of when he was in his draft year, he came through the offices, came through the, the newsroom, and he walked by my desk. And I knew who he was, um, but if I didn't and you had told me that he was like an edge rusher, I would have been like, yeah, okay, sure. Mm -hmm. 
because he was that big and that built that if he was like, yeah, no, he's – if you would ask me, I'd be like, oh, yeah, no, he'll get like 10 sacks this year. I believe yeah. that. I mean, that's, that is just what he looks like. And so I got him an eight. You know, he's 30. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's that. But other than that, I mean, you couldn't have asked for a better fit than this. Yeah, we, we nerds have been betting against Derrick Henry long enough, citing the, well, his <laughs> rushing yards over expectation and his yards after contact per attempt. and his Don't say we nerds. Rate. Say you yeah, they, nerds. You, know, they're, they're <laughs> you. His efficiency numbers have been trending down for the last couple of years, but it doesn't matter. This offense, Gus Edwards scored 13 rushing touchdowns last year, okay? Gus Edwards. I think Derrick Henry is going to score a lot of touchdowns here. So, so my hype meter – for Derrick Henry is a nine. I don't think that he has, you know, a 2000 yard season um, in, in his bag of tricks or anything like that. I don't think we're going to see 1500 yards, but he is going to score a ton of touchdowns for whatever reason. When they get near the goal line, that's when Lamar Jackson abandons his scrambling abilities. He doesn't run near the goal line. He's going to turn around. He's going to give the ball to his six foot two monster of a running back, and he is going to score a ton of touchdowns. So uh, for that reason alone, I'm very excited about Derrick Henry in Baltimore. Yeah, I'm going to give him an eight here in Baltimore. And I mean, we're all seem to be pretty excited. I think that running back, maybe running back 10, running back 12, being in that range is still very, very realistic for Derrick Henry here. Touchdowns are typically hard to predict, but not in this offense where things could be really, really good for Baltimore. And I know that Derrick Henry has never really been the pass catching kind of guy. It's almost like the perfect fit, him ending up in Baltimore, because this isn't really the op the offense where running backs are catching a ton of passes. So it's just there's going to be a lot of goal line opportunity for him. I think everyone's just here echoing the same thing. If we're going just purely off aesthetics and how damn cool he's going to look in a Ravens <laughs> uniform, that's a 12. But for this, I'll go with an eight. Uh, let's go from uh, one purple team to another purple team. Aaron Jones goes to the Vikings. Marcus, how excited are we about this? Uh. I don't know, give me a five. I'm just sort of in the middle on this. I mean, and it's, it's look, when, when Aaron Jones was healthy last year, he played really well, um, especially down the stretch. Late in the season, he got healthy. Into the playoffs, he played really, really well in those, those couple of playoff games the Packers had. Um, but there are just a lot of questions in Minnesota. I mean, they've got pass catchers, obviously, but who's going to be the quarterback is a big question. I mean, I guess it's Sam Darnold, unless they decide to, you know, I don't know, somehow move up and, and try to draft somebody. I don't know. But this is an offense that I don't think is going to be nearly as productive as what he had in Green Bay last year. So that's going to bring down his touchdown upside. So I think there's, you know, potential for him to be productive. I think he catches the ball. I think he runs fairly effectively. I'm not so worried about Ty Chandler. I know Kevin O'Connell was talking him up at the Combine, but – um you know, he needed Alexander Madison to be awful and he needed Cam Akers to get hurt to really consistently get on the field. So that doesn't really make me feel threatened about him. Uh, I just I just think the Vikings not being as dynamic or high scoring of an offense really is going to put a damper on what Aaron Jones can do this year. Yeah, I'm right about there with you, Marcus. I'm at a five as well. Um, and, and I keep going back to because Aaron Jones did look really good last year, but he came in so late in the season that I just keep finding myself asking myself the same question. Is it that he's still really, really good, which could be possible? Or is it just that at that point in the season, everybody else was banged up and a little bit <laughs> right. slow and he was coming in on relatively fresh legs in week 16 when he finally came back? What's concerning to me more than anything it's that the Packers were willing to eat almost $13 million in dead cap just to rid themselves of Aaron Jones. So I don't know if they know something about his medicals that, you know, his hamstrings just might not be working anymore or what it is, but really surprising to see them willing to just cut bait of a guy that we think is pretty talented, willing to eat that much dead cap rather than just keep him around. So I, I do have some concerns here. And on top of that, Ty Chandler looked really good. And I think if you put these guys in a foot race, Ty Chandler is probably the faster of the two right now. Um, so even if Aaron Jones starts the season as the starter, I could see Ty Chandler carving out a bigger and bigger role, just like he did last year with Alexander Madison. So first of all, Marcus, if we're going to be friends, you can't say bad things about my baby boy, Ty Chandler here. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's first of all. Uh, you know what, guys? It's, it's fives across the board. It's fives across the board. Aaron Jones, he turns 30 this season in December. He missed or left early due to injury in nine games last year. It's just, uh, Dave, I know you're saying like maybe the medical staff like knows that something that we don't. Um, I don't know if it's actually all that. I know there was some talk about like, the, the whole they wanted him to restructure his contract and he wouldn't. And so they were just like, all right, we're going to sign Josh Jacobs and bump you out of here. So, I mean, it just the actions speak really loud in this case. And uh, 
man, going to the Vikings, it's just, it's going to be rough where I don't think he's going to be the focal point of the offense. We kind of saw what happened to an aging Dalvin Cook in that offense, even with a better quarterback and with an offense that was actually able to score points. We don't know what's going to happen here, and it's a very average offensive line. So, yeah, I'm just going to give this one an average score. The next guy on here, I mean, this is Joe Mixon going to the Texans. This was, I think, the spot that a lot of people wanted to see a big name running back go to, like a Saquon or Derrick Henry. And not quite as big a name, but a decent landing spot here for Joe Mixon, Marcus. Yeah, uh, I'm going to give this a six. Uh, I mean, I know that that you mentioned Saquon was a name that I thought would land there potentially. Uh, Look, I think for Joe Mixon, this was about the best case scenario because it seemed like he was on his way to getting cut. And then all of a sudden he lands in Houston uh, with an emerging offense. I mean, you know, we saw what they did last year with Stroud and Collins and Tank Dell. I mean, this is an offense that is definitely on the rise there uh, with a team that I think is is going to be a bully in the AFC South for the next few years. But I also think, like, at this point, we know who Joe Mixon is. And I don't think it necessarily gets better or worse. It kind of stays the same in Houston. He'll catch the ball occasionally. He'll get you some decent uh, some decent uh, games on the ground. We'll see how he works kind of in the zone run scheme that, that Bobby Slowick wants to run down there in Houston. But um, – I think Joe Mixon is going to continue to be the same Joe Mixon where like, you know, he'll have spike weeks. He'll have some really bad weeks. And at the end of the year, you're going to look at it and he's like, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, Joe Mixon was like QB 10 it was, or the RB 10. It wasn't a terrible season. Um, you know, just sort of forgetting the week to week headaches that there are. So give me a six. Uh, I think it just kind of is what it is. Yeah, and I mean, if I'm looking, you know, ranking this hype meter relative to the other guys, I'm more excited about Joe Mixon than I am about Aaron Jones, and I'm less excited than I am about Saquon Barkley, so I, I've got to put him as a six as well. Um, I think it's a pretty lateral move from Cincinnati. You know, it's going to be another really high-flying, high-scoring offense, and Joe Mixon, again, we could cite the efficiency numbers that he's been trending downward, that he's got a lot of usage on him and all these sorts of things. But it's a good offense that made Devin Singletary look like a Pro Bowl running back last year. So if Devin Singletary could look really good in this creative run blocking scheme with Bobby Slowick. I think Joe Mixon is going to do all right as well. I just because I have Saquon Barkley at a seven, I can't put him any higher than that. So six, a little bit more than average excited. But at the end of the day, it's it, it's still Joe Mixon. OK, so I'm not going to finish this off with a six for very obvious <laughs> reasons here. Um, so I'm going to go with a seven. And a lot of it, a lot of it is what you said, Dave, right? It's It's the lateral move here to the Texans. And I think it's almost I don't want to say that he almost jumped ship from the Bengals at the right time and not that he had that choice, but going to the Texans is actually as lateral as it is. There's still an upward trajectory with that team where I don't know if the same thing was happening with the Bengals and they've had these offensive line struggles over the years. Uh, We kind of got to see that even Devin Singletary, who we'll probably talk about here in a little bit, got to be the running back 15 over the final eight weeks of the season. And he was productive and Joe Mixon, like Marcus mentioned, has just been this guy that is always hovering around running back 10 last year was running back six before that running back four uh, there's been some really good productive years here for joe mixon i think the thing that's like always buoyed him has been the receptions and the touchdowns 50 receptions 10 touchdowns is still very much on the table in this offense and right now he's being drafted on underdog fantasy as the running back 17 i think that that's maybe the yeah, I think maybe the market hasn't caught up to that yet. And I do think that uh, maybe not as high as Derrick Henry here, but I do think that running back 12 still absolutely remains in range of outcomes for Joe Mixon here. I mean, so much of this is relative to ADP, and we don't have ADP at this point in the offseason. But if Joe Mixon is somehow staying in that range and getting drafted at like the 3-4 turn, I'm going to be drafting a lot of Joe Mixon. I mean, if, if that, like relative to ADP, if he's staying at the end of the third round, consider my hype meter a 10 because I will be drafting him all day at that price. Yeah. yeah. Very true. All right. So maybe some guys here that we're not as excited about, but I don't know. I don't want to, I don't want to spoil it here. Tony Pollard goes to the Titans where I think that was kind of a move that left a lot of people scratching their heads. Uh, Marcus, how are you feeling here about Tony Pollard going from what seemed like a ton of opportunity in Dallas last season to now a split backfield potentially here in Tennessee? Yeah, I'm a, I don't know. I'm, I'm waffling between a two or a three. Let's, let's be, a, let's, let's go positive and say a three uh, on Tony. So Pollard. Positive. <laughs> We're going positive and going a three on Tony Pollard because one, the offense is not going to be as good as what he was in, in Dallas. Um, you know, now he's also sharing that backfield with Tajay Spears, who I really liked. 
uh, when he was drafted. I, you know, I, I felt like Spears would be able to carve out a role even with Derrick Henry in that backfield. And so then with Henry leaving, it was like, all right, well, now there's an opportunity to see really what he can do. And they bring in a guy who does so many of the same things that Ty J. Spears does in an offense that just isn't going to score a ton. And in an offense that looks like they want to try to throw the ball more. I mean, they've already got DeAndre Hopkins. They go out, they add Calvin Ridley. Um, you know, there's a new new play caller, new offensive coordinator there. I mean, just so many things are different, and it just feels like a change in philosophy is coming. Uh, I'm not fired up about it. I guess the upside is, you know, people saying that maybe – Pollard wasn't fully healthy. He was still sort of dealing with the, the remnants of that foot injury, and maybe so, but I, I just look at Tennessee and I'm just like, meh. And then on top of it, he's sharing opportunities with another guy. I just I can't get fired up about it. Yeah, I'll, I'll inject a little bit of optimism in here, but not much. I'm going to go with a four uh, compared to your three, Marcus. <laughs> so still not too fired up about him, but um, everything you said, I echo those sentiments. First of all, I think the last year, uh, everybody really soured on him, but we have to look at the injury, and that took him some time to get back from. And down the stretch, when he finally did look like the Tony Pollard of old, then he just had this wildly unlucky touchdown rate where he was just getting stuffed at like the one foot yard every or the one foot line every single time he got down into the red zone. So um, I, I don't think Tony Pollard's a bad running back by any means, but like you kind of mentioned here, what I struggle with is the overlapping skill sets with Tajay Spears. They are such similar players that I don't know what these roles are going to be. Like we knew with Derrick Henry and Tajay Spears that Derrick Henry was going to get the early down in the goal line work. And we knew that when third down came around, they were going to go to Tajay Spears and he could be the jitterbug out in space and make big plays. But Tony Pollard and Tajay Spears do all of the same things. So I don't know how I expect this workload to shake out. I think that, again, trying to play ADP a little bit here, I expect Tony Pollard to be drafted earlier. So I'm probably not going to draft a lot of Tony Pollard in drafts this year. I'm just going to wait to take Tajay Spears later, who I think is a very similar player, can do a lot of the same things, and will probably be going four, five, six rounds cheaper. I think right now, guys, I might just be out on the Titans as an offense altogether. Because it's it just it just to me, it just spells something bad here. This combination of uncertainty and redundancy and then the potential to be also really, really bad with Will Levis. And I almost don't care what the prices are for these players. I'd rather just not deal with it. And for that reason, I'm going to put Tony Pollard. You know what? I had him as, as a four and then just sitting here listening to the pitches. Marcus, you, <laughs> I'm moving it to a three. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just so out on this Tennessee Titans offense. So much of it. You know, what's interesting. What I think the worst case scenario for the Titans offense in fantasy is um, it's not just being bad, right? Because if they're bad, it's easy for us to be like, yep, we're out. It's that they are just good enough to get us yes. interested, but not good enough for us to feel confident starting their players. Like being in that sort of purgatory is the worst possible scenario. And that's sort of what I, because look, DeAndre Hopkins, not the guy he was, but still can, you know, be that guy occasionally. Calvin Ridley, same thing. Pollard, same thing. Ty J. Spear. It's like all these guys that are like almost really kind of good, but maybe not. And that to me is the most frustrating thing. So I think what I'm the the current read I have on this, I, I'm with you. I don't know if it's going to be DeAndre Hopkins or Kelvin Ridley you want, or if it's going to be Tony Pollard or Tajay Spears that you want. I do think I want some Will Levis though, just in case it does does all work out. I mean, Levis is the guy that's going to be providing the offensive goodness here. So with him getting drafted as kind of a back end QB two right now, he's one of those late round guys that I'm willing to throw some darts on, just in case it somehow does all come together. Sigh. I said that about Trevor Lawrence last year, too. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be Christian Kirk or Calvin Ridley or Evan Ingram, but, you know, Trevor yeah. Lawrence is going to be dealing it out. Yeah. <laughs> so. well, I remember we said that a couple years ago about uh, Ben Roethlisberger, too, and, you know, all of these weapons, and somehow all of his weapons were productive, and he was like the QB 21 on the year, so uh. not always the best policy, but I'll, I'll go back <laughs> to it from time to time. DeAndre Swift signs with the Bears. And it kind of seemed like everyone got really excited and then realized like, yeah. oh, wait, they still have yeah. two other running backs. Yeah. And oh, wait, it's going to be a rookie quarterback. And then, oh, wait, there's just seems like there's a lot of oh, waits that are right there. And um, we got I'll, excited I'll because probably... it was announced immediately. We didn't know any better. We didn't know what was coming. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm just going to throw my score out immediately here. I'm at a five where just, I just think DeAndre Swift is a good player. I think there will be, he's obviously the clear lead running back in this, 
But I think there's just enough of having to share with Khalil Herbert and Roshan Johnson and dealing with a rookie quarterback and all the things that come with this Bears offense. And now adding Keenan Allen, who's going to take targets away. It's just it's not a great look. So, Marcus, where are you at on this? I mean, I'm at a four, so I'm not far off from where you are for all the reasons you said. I mean, I like Roshan Johnson and I want to see him get a bigger opportunity. Uh, I, I don't. From what it sounds like, Khalil Herbert isn't much longer for this team. Like, this could probably be his last go-around in Chicago. So, like, that potentially would have opened up some avenues. But um, I've said this for years. We can figure out a two-man backfield in fantasy. It's a three-headed monster that is just a nightmare. And I feel like that's going to be the situation, that it's going to be a three-man situation. Um, You mentioned the rookie quarterback, the wide receivers. Uh, I mean, I'm curious what, what, you know, Supreme Bears fan Dave Kluge has to think about it, but I'm just I'm at a four. I'm just kind of meh on on DeAndre Swift in this offense. Yeah, I, I'm at a four as well. Um, I think the one kind of silver lining you might be able to take away from here is if you look historically, Luke Getze, who was the offensive coordinator last year, dating back to his time in Green Bay, he's always had a rotation. Do you remember when like we were like screaming free Aaron Jones and he was saying, "No, I'm giving 50 percent of the touches to Jabal Williams," and it was so frustrating. We're on, and then, then the same thing, you know, the last year, obviously, in Chicago, where they had this three headed committee with Deontay Foreman and Khalil Herbert. We never knew how to make sense of it. Shane Waldron has been a little bit more um, likely to lean on one guy. Even last year, when they had Zach Charbonnet, they were still saying, no, Ken Walker's our guy. And then if you look back at his time with uh, the, the, the Rams, you know, whether it was Cam Akers or whoever it was for any given week, whoever was healthy, they'd lean on them pretty heavily. The issue I have is I don't think. DeAndre Swift is a three down back. He's really good when he can get in space and he's really good at catching the balls, but he's not that early down thumper. And I don't know if that role is going to go to Khalil Herbert or if it's going to go to Roshan Johnson. So I think we are going to be looking at kind of a messy backfield here. Don't get me wrong. DeAndre Swift is talented, but he has done something to just sour the coaching staff everywhere he's been. I mean, like we saw it last year where he was like the outside of week one, Kenneth Gainwell got hurt and then he became the workhorse. And then just slowly they started to pull that role away from him. We saw it in Detroit as well. I, I can't help but keep going back to hard knocks a few years ago when Deuce Staley was like ripping him apart in the film room for not finishing runs. And you see that DeAndre Swift, so talented, so fast, so elusive, but he does too much dancing. He does too much east-west stuff, and he just needs to put his head forward and pick down, pick up the hard yards, and he doesn't do that enough. And I think that's why coaches, year after year, just kind of take his role away from him. So I want to be excited, but I, I, I can't get above a four. All right, that's all the time we've got for today. We'll be back next week. <laughs> I rambled. It's the one bear we got to talk about. I know, I know, I know. You, you, you put your heart on your sleeve, and I love you for it. Um, let's do this. Let's get to our last running back here, and then I got a, kind of a group of them that will cluster up here. So Austin Eckler goes to the Commanders. This was a name that was just so big for fantasy even just a year ago where the name value was just totally different. Now we see him where... It might even be a scenario where he could be the 1B, the 1A. We don't know. It's not probably not a great offense. It's probably going to be a rookie quarterback. There's so many questions here. Marcus, where are you at with Austin Eckler going to the Commanders? I'm at a five on Austin Eckler because of the unknowns there. Um, you know, I think last year what we saw from him, I think we saw a guy who got hurt early in the season, had that high ankle sprain early in the year. And at least to me, it felt like he rushed back. Um, for a couple of reasons. I think he rushed back one because he definitely wanted to help the team win. But also, I mean, he sort of knew what his contract situation was and he wanted to get out there and put some good things on tape. And I just I think you saw him playing last year on an ankle that wasn't fully healthy and it affected his performance. Now he goes to a place with, you know, there's going to be a new quarterback. We don't know who it's going to be just yet. Um, you know, they've got some decent wide receivers. I don't know how much Cliff Kingsbury is going to like Brian Robinson versus, uh, you know, Austin Eckler coming in there. There's just so much. His pass catching ability is undoubted, right? He's going to catch the football. How much they use him as a runner, I think, remains to be seen. And so just the that cloud of unknown has me sitting right in the middle of the five. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to be a total wet blanket here, and I'm sorry to do this, but I'm at a two. I've got almost no excitement here. Um, I, I think Brian Robinson is a good running back, and they've shown that they like to use him. And I don't, I don't know who Washington's taking it to, whether it's going to be Drake May or Jaden Daniels, but both of these guys have legs. And we see that 
scrambling quarterbacks and especially young scrambling quarterbacks don't check down to running backs all that often. And that's where so much of his value comes from. Austin Eckler is great, but he's never rushed for a thousand yards. Almost all of his value comes in the passing game. And I don't know if we're going to see him allotted that role in Washington. So uh, again, maybe, maybe I'm being a wet blanket here. Maybe I should be buying into it a little bit more, but I, I'm at a two right now. God, let's let's go play the lottery because Dave and I are agreeing on something here. <laughs> I'm not super excited about Austin Eckler either. Oddly enough, I'm a little bit higher. I'm at a three. Uh, I, I do think that Brian, so we there was an interview that Dan Quinn did recently. Actually, I believe with Matthew Barry, Marcus, and um, Dan Quinn was just talking up Brian Robinson about how he's this this such a tough runner that can close out games, and that's what you need. And you know they're going to want to try to win with with their defense and close out games and. Obviously, that sounds nice. As the commanders, right. you're going to have to actually get a lead if you want to do that. <laughs> right. But, but I, I think the whole thing for them is going to be let's let's try to make this as easy as we can on whatever rookie quarterback we get in there. I think if it's Jaden Daniels, I think you end up with a little bit less of the the drop downs to the running back uh, because Jaden Daniels just ha- just has a superior r- rushing ability out there. You know, he's got gets all the comps to Lamar Jackson. But Austin Eckler, it's just. It just never seems to be a good bet, guys, to bet on older running backs moving to a new team that are used to a bit role. Um, I, I think that it just all depends. You can spin this yarn any different way. Anthony Lynn is there. Cliff Kingsbury is there. Dan Quinn is there. Uh, there's a million different ways to go, but no matter which way we go, I'm just not that excited about Austin. And, and that's what we're, we're talking about all these concerns. This could be another scenario where he gets pushed so far down in ADP mm-hmm. that right. it's actually worth taking the risk because we're talking yep. about all of the uncertainty and in that uncertainty and in that ambiguity is also where you tend to find good value. So, so much of what we're doing right now, we're being reactive, but it's going to come down to ADP in a couple of months here before you can really plant any flags. Come on, we got to believe in him. He's one of us, man. Like he's a he's he a, loves fantasy, a legit true. fantasy true. player. Like we got to we got to prop up Austin Eckler just because he's one of us, man. <laughs> All right, so there are three running backs here that I'm going to kind of put into a cluster. Let's see which one of them that you guys believe in. So Devin Singletary goes to the Giants, Zach Moss to the Bengals, and Gus Edwards to the Chargers. Sorry, I couldn't get that last one out without chuckling a little bit just because it's John Harbaugh. (laughs) So Singletary, Moss, Edwards, who are we believing in most for 2024? Uh, For me, it's Zach Moss. I mean, he's the guy who goes to the best situation overall. Uh, you know, as long as Joe Burrow is healthy, that offense is going to be great again this year. And, I mean, let's be honest, Zach Moss played really well last year. I mean, at the beginning of the year um, when when Jonathan Taylor was hurt, uh, who was it? There was another running back. They were like, oh, no, watch out for this guy. And then, like, he played, like, two snaps, and then Zach uh, Moss came back Hull, in. I Evan, think. yeah. Yeah, there's uh, Evan Hole. Everybody's like, yeah, watch it. Evan Hole could be has <laughs> sleeper vibes. Zach Moss comes back in like week two and starts just crushing it and made everybody forget about Evan Hall. Even those first couple weeks when Taylor was back, I mean, Moss was still out there killing it. So you take that guy, you put him in a great offense in Cincinnati. He's the guy I like the most. I low-key kind of like Gus Edwards. I admit I'm sort of a Gus Edwards stan in the fact that he goes to an offense with Harbaugh and Greg Roman knowing that they want to run the football <laughs> and knowing that his ADP is going to be really, really low. Like the the risk that, that you're taking in, in drafting Gus Edwards or picking him off the waiver wire or whatever, like the risk is super minimal for a potential like decent number there. But of those three, Zach Moss is easily the guy I like the most. Yeah, and they have no pass catchers, so they're going to have to run the ball in Los Angeles this year. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if somehow Gus Edwards stumbled. You don't say. (laughs) That being said, I'm going with Zach Moss as well. Um, You know, I talked about Joe Mixon being a lateral move to Houston. I think that Cincinnati going from Joe Mixon to Zach Moss is kind of a lateral move. So I'm looking at a lot of people's rankings right now, and Zach Moss is in like the, the 25 to 30 range. I think that's just way underpriced. And maybe I'm just being a complete idiot here, but I see Zach Moss, the presumed starter for what's going to be a very good offense with Joe Burrow. So I'm kind of looking at Zach Moss as a top 15 running back right now. Um, Of course, there's Chase Brown who can cut into that workload quite a bit. And maybe I'm being overreactive here, but um, I think one thing is for sure. If Saquon Barkley couldn't get it done in New York, I don't think any of us are really buying into Devin Singletary there. Mm -mm. Nope. Yeah, I, I, I like Zach Moss as well. Um, I do think Chase Brown is going to have a significant role there. We saw him start to take work away from Joe Mixon last year as the as the season kind of came to an end. Uh, I do think Zach Moss will probably be like a 1A. He's going to be one of those guys that's hanging around running back 24 area. And that ADP is probably not going to shoot up because the average fantasy player just really doesn't care about Zach Moss. And they're going to be like, oh, he's the starting running back for the Bengals? I didn't even know that the day you get to your draft. 
Uh, but interesting stat here that I found on, on Zach Moss, and then we'll move on here. This is courtesy of Scott Barrett over at Fantasy Points. The Bengals were first in the NFL in running back carries from shotgun in 11 personnel. They had the highest percentage mm. of plays run from that personnel set. Zach Moss was second in the NFL in yards per carry from that exact personnel set. So they went out and got Zach Moss with the exact idea that we are going to plug him in to do what he does best in an offensive system that fits his skill set. So, yeah, I mean, Dave, like everything you're saying is true. Yeah, crazy, right? <laughs> Put people let's, in a position to succeed. Let's get guys who are good at the thing that we do. Like, that's yeah. weird, right? <laughs> so, I mean, Dave, like what you're saying, it might sound crazy, right? Like, I'm sure the YouTube commenters are going to be totally normal about this, but Zach Moss could be one of those guys that next year we're like, yeah, how did he end up finishing top 15? That's nuts. So it, it's definitely it's definitely possible. Kind of like we said about Joe Mixon, year after year after year after year, right? <laughs> <laughs> after year, yeah. Uh, let's go to the wide receivers here. Keenan Allen goes to the Bears in a move that was, I mean, it's. It, I keep saying this over and over and over. That was really surprising. This was just a wild free agency and trading period here. But Keenan Allen goes to the Bears, and I, I'm not sure how I feel about it. It's definitely, I think, a downward trend for him. Marcus, how do you feel about this one? Yeah, I'm not really sure how to how to feel. About about this one i'm gonna i'm gonna go with a six um because i think keenan allen is still a really good player right he is i i have this sort of mental list of, of fantasy wide receivers that we take for granted and keenan allen i think is very high on that list it's like he always seems to slip a round or two in adp and then like at the end of the year he gives you you know 100 catches 11 1200 yards like eight to ten touchdowns like who needs that Pfft, not me um and I think going to Chicago with presumably Caleb Williams there at quarterback, I think that's a great mix. Um, having watched every Caleb Williams snap for the last two seasons, he gets a lot of of hype for what he does out of structure, and he's great. Like there is at least one or two plays in every USC game where like things break down, and Caleb seems to pull a rabbit out of his hat and make something happen. But I think that sort of overshadows what he does on platform when he is within structure i mean he's got a great repeatable motion he is good at hitting receivers in stride the trojans had a tough time getting guys open for him now you have a wide receiver who all he does is get open i mean that is that is keenan allen's stock in trade so pairing them together just seems like a great mix so i think in that respect it's sort of exciting but i don't know that the numbers he gives you are going to be any greater in Chicago than they have been all these years in Los Angeles. So I think in that respect, it stays steady. I think he's a solid wide receiver, too, with wide receiver one tendencies occasionally. Um, you know, so it, it sort of stays status quo. So it's hard for me to get super excited, but I'm also not down on him either. Yeah, and, and last year was kind of a weird year. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, Alfredo, we could pat ourselves on the back real quickly. We were, we were really high on Keenan Allen last year because we talked about this Kellen Moore offense and how they like to really hyper-focus on the wide receiver one and use him in creative ways. And that's exactly what we saw last year. I mean, Keenan Allen set career highs in targets per game, in receiving yards per game. Very rarely do you see a guy have a, a career year at age 31, but now he's going to a team that's presumably going to pass a little bit less. And now he's going to have to compete with DJ Moore, who draws a ton of targets himself. So, um, you know, I, I'm talking a lot here, but I'm I'm, a, I'm at a five for Keenan Allen. I think that he's going to be great to mentor the other wide receivers. He's going to be great to help uh, Caleb Williams develop. But I think that we're not going to see him put up the same production that he has over his years in Los Angeles. We got to remember last year, Austin Eckler was injured. Mike Williams was injured. I mean, he was the only guy out there that was a legitimate threat. And now he's competing with more target competition on what we expect to be a smaller pie. I'll finish this off here with a six. And it's just because Keenan Allen is just too talented for me to start to be down on him. As much as I wanted to start to panic of it's going to an offense that already has DJ Moore, and now it's got three running backs and DeAndre Swift who also catches passes out of the backfield. And there, there's just so many little things here and there that we can nitpick at. But at the end of the day, it's also just Keenan Allen is incredibly talented. He's going to be open quite often for Caleb Williams. And we actually don't know what Caleb's tendencies are going to be once he gets into the NFL. I mean, these guys typically magnetize themselves to a receiver and that ends up being their guy. You don't see rookies going out there and really slinging the ball around pretty evenly to multiple players and kind of running an offense pretty nicely. They usually want to latch onto one guy. And if I had to pick who that is, I would assume it's probably Keenan because he's he's better at getting open. But I mean, it's just there's so many things here at place. So I'll, I'll leave him at a six just straight on talent alone. Uh, Deontay Johnson goes to the Panthers. 
this is probably the move that I'm going to self-admittedly say. I'm probably too excited about it, but I want to hear where you guys are at. Marcus, let's start with you. Um, I mean, I think it's a four for me. I think I think it's a good move for Bryce Young, right? One of the big knocks on the Panthers pass catching group is that nobody could get open. I mean, the fact that uh, Adam Thielen had you know sort of resurrected himself for a year, I think, speaks a lot to what that pass catching group is. So Deontay Johnson can run routes, he can get open, um, but the offense. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I, I, at best, it's a lateral move from where he was in Pittsburgh. More likely, right. it's probably a, a step back. So I think it's a I think it's a better move for the Panthers in real football than it is for fantasy. Yeah, I, I think I don't know how excited Alfredo is, but I'm at an eight. And again, maybe I'm just a sucker. I love Deontay Johnson. I've always been a big fan of his game. He is going to immediately solidify himself as the wide receiver one here. If Adam Thielen could pull 137 targets last year, I'm taking the over for Deontay Johnson. So again, looking at this through a fantasy lens, they don't have a first round pick, so they're not going to be able to add another first round wide receiver. I mean, it's going to be the Deontay Johnson show for the most part. The only guy he has to compete with is Adam Thielen, who we saw look really good for like six weeks and then just kind of turned into a corn husk in the second half of the season. So I I think Deontay Johnson realistically could pull like 150 plus targets in this offense next year. This is the formula for alienating Marcus and him never wanting to come back. It's just us <laughs> ganging up on him, ganging up on him, and being like, "Yeah, I'm." Just, just I'm go also... with the four, Alfredo. <laughs> no, no, I won't. Do... I am. I am irrationally excited about the Deontay Johnson move. And Dave, it's exactly what you said. So I'm not going to repeat it. It's the targets. It's it's Dave Canales too, who I think mm-hmm. is going to do work wonders here for Bryce Young. We've seen what he can do for Baker Mayfield, for Geno Smith. Uh, I do think that Bryce Young is a much better quarterback than what we saw last year and then back to what Marcus was talking about with Adam Thielen if that guy could do it well we got to assume Deontay Johnson is coming out and potentially taking on that same role if not better and being able to produce that same way and I mean Dave there was one point in the middle of the year where you and I were arguing where you had uh, Adam Thielen as like a top 12 wide receiver and I I thought that was ridiculous And yeah, but like, but for a while there, like we were having that conversation and if we can even have that conversation for a little bit about Deontay Johnson this year, to me, it's a big positive move. Uh, Let's get to our our final two wide receivers here that we're talking about. Calvin Ridley goes to the Titans and we talked earlier about the Titans running back situation, the receiver room, at least in my eyes, I think there's a lot of different ways we can go about this. A lot of people are saying, oh, the, the Jaguars didn't use Calvin Ridley how they were supposed to. Well, if you don't use him that way, you're going to end up using him the same way that the Titans already used DeAndre Hopkins. And we're talking about more redundancy and more scary things with Will Levis. So, Marcus, how excited or not excited are you with Calvin Ridley? Uh, I'll give it I'll give it another six. Um, You know, I I think you'll be fine. Um, But you're right. There's a lot of redundancy there. Right. Like and does Will Levis pick a favorite and who would that favorite be? I mean, I don't know. It just feels like, like I said earlier, the Titans are going to be sort of in that fantasy purgatory where their guys are going to be just interesting enough that you draft them and you roster them and maybe you start them occasionally and you're going to look every single week. And when, you know, Calvin Ridley is constantly giving you that like nine, 10 points, you're going to be like, uh, you know, it's just, it just feels like that is the inevitable outcome here. So he's a talented player. I don't love the situation. I give it a six. Yeah, it, it, it's a five for me. I don't really have anything to add to what you just said. Um, again, so much uncertainty here. I, I, I don't know if it's going to be him or DeAndre Hopkins. I don't know if Will Levis is going to be able to support anything more than like a 3,000 yard passing offense. So I'm right in the middle of my hype meter with a five. For all the reasons listed here already, I am also at a five. And we continue to alienate Marcus and leave him alone <laughs> on an island. Uh, yeah, we, we were close enough. I can reach there. out and shout at you guys from my <laughs> island. It's fine, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to the last guy here on the list. Marquise Brown goes to the Chiefs, and every single dynasty manager everywhere just let out a deep sigh of relief that Hollywood Brown has a little bit more life left. Going to play with the Lisan Al Gaib over in Kansas City. <laughs> let's let's see what happens, man. Because like this is what people have wanted: is get Marquise Brown in a good situation, go get Patrick Mahomes, a good wide receiver. All right, we did it. Now let's see: is he going to be the, the 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 wide receiver one over there? Is it still Rasheed Rice, Travis Kelsey? How many targets does he still continue to take? What's the health like, Marcus? Where are you at with Marquise Brown? 
Uh, I'll give it. I'll give it a seven. I mean, it was one of the things that I had kind of sort of predicted. I feel like because doing this job, we are all contractually obligated. At least for a while, we were contractually obligated to project a wide receiver to the Chiefs, um, especially after the departure of Tyreek Hill. Um, so. This was about kind of what I was hoping for. Uh, you know, I, he can be that downfield threat that Mark, that MVS never was, but I think he can also do a lot more other things, too. He's not just a field stretcher. He can give you a, a lot more of the route options there. And Rasheed Rice was nice. It was nice to see him develop as the, the season went along, but they need a true wide receiver one. They've got, you know, the, right now Travis Kelsey is their wide receiver one. Now they have an actual wide receiver one there. So this was what I was sort of hoping. I like the fit. Um, so I'll give that a seven. I, I think it's uh, it's a positive. Yeah, I'm at a seven as well. Um, great quarterback pairing. You know, it, what, what I'm really interested to see is how defenses are going to play the Chiefs because we saw them just sit consistently in two high covers last year, and Patrick Mahomes just picked them apart. You know, throwing little four yard passes nonstop, and that's how he won a Super Bowl. And now all of a sudden. Um, you know, if you do that and try to take away a legitimate deep threat in Marquise Brown, all you're doing is opening up even more opportunities for Rashi Rice. So I think this is the perfect of all the guys that were available, whether it was through a trade or free agency. Marquise Brown makes the most sense for this Chiefs offense because he, you, you said it, Marcus, and I, I agree with you. He can do so much more than just run a nine route. He is m more versatile, but even when he's running those more intricate routes, he's typically doing them a little bit further downfield. And if you look, the numbers back it up. His average target depth is almost three times higher than Rashi Rice's. So I think what this does is it really is going to just give defenses headaches. They're going to have to choose. Are they going to get beat, beat deep by Marquise Brown or are they going to let Rashi Rice eat underneath? Either way, this is great for the Chiefs. It's great for Patrick Mahomes, great for Marquise Brown and great for Rashi Rice. So, um, I, I'm, you know, I, I talked myself from a seven to an eight. I'm, I'm very excited <laughs> about this one. <laughs> All right, well, then I'm going to bring it right back down because I'm at a six. And it, one of the reasons simply is because of the health of Marquise Brown. Like, we know the talent is there, but can he be healthy? Does he have, can, can that foot do what it used to be able to do when he was this highly touted prospect coming out of Oklahoma? And to me, what's so interesting is, Dave, you talk about kind of like how Marquise Brown's going to take the top off. And they can use Rasheed Rice underneath. Well, the interesting thing is that we've seen these roles be all over the place throughout their time in the NFL. Over in Arizona, we've seen Marquise Brown be the guy that's catching screens. Uh, Rasheed Rice back at SMU was the deep ball guy going up for 50-50 catches. So I'm going to be very intrigued to see what happens with these roles. I think that what this does is... I think it's going to maybe send us back to the 2022 Chiefs where we don't really know who's going to be the top wide receiver. And you're going to see a lot of guys doing different things as opposed to real wide receiver target hogs and a guy that we can count on every single week. So I do think this might bring Rasheed Rice down a little bit while it brings Marquise Brown up a little bit. But I think that that ceiling gets a little capped there over oh. in Kansas City. All I'll say, Alfredo, I had the same thoughts as you because it seemed like there were so many screens and slants I don't like going it. to Marquise Brown last year. He had the second highest A dot of his career last year in Arizona, which really, really surprised me. Eh, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, right, you want me to do the through... rundown real quickly of who we're most excited about position by position now? Yes, we'll yes, let's show. get it. All right. Yes. For quarterbacks, most excited, Kirk Cousins. We are at an 8.3 on the hype meter. Just behind him, Justin Fields at 3.7, and then Russell Wilson down at the bottom at 3.0. Uh, for running backs, I'm surprised by this, but we are most excited about Derrick Henry at an 8.7. Saquon Barkley just below at 8.3. After that, at 6.3, Joe Mixon comes in at our as our third most excited guy. Uh, then Aaron Jones at 5, then Austin Eckler at 4.7, and then at the bottom of the list, we've got Tony Pollard and Austin Eckler both at 3.3 and four receivers. The guy that we are most excited about weighed heavily by Alfredo and I, Deontay Johnson <laughs> at 6.7. After that, Keenan Allen at a 5.7. Calvin Ridley at a 5.3. Oh, I'm wrong. I forgot. Marquise Brown, 7.0, is actually the guy we are most See, this is, why I don't trust you. this is why I don't <laughs> trust you with stats because you're not good with numbers. And, uh, yeah, you know, we, we almost had it. We almost had it. <laughs> oh, that's the new tagline for the show. We almost, we had, almost it. had it. We almost had it. 
Well, we were able to get through the quarterbacks, the running backs, the receivers. We don't really care much about tight ends over here, but uh, this was great. We got to go back through this whole free agency timeline here, see where everyone's going. Uh, the offseason's still not done. We've got more free agency moves and more trades that are going to happen. The NFL draft is coming up, so stay with us because we're going to be talking about rookies. We're going to be back again next Monday. Uh, I want to give a big thank you. Marcus, thank you so much for joining us here today, man. Appreciate you guys having me on. This was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. All right. Well, we'll be back again next week for myself, for Dave Kluge, for everyone here at Football Guys. We want to thank you for listening and watching all the way through. We'll see you next time. Adios. 